Bodies of four young women, all seriously decomposed, in fact skeletal, were discovered over three days. I was in police headquarters in my office when I got a call uh, that they had found another body, and uh, it was unbelievable. And then sometime later, the chief of detectives called me and says, we found another body, and then another one. And I can tell you that that was a really uh, a shock. He took away somebody's mother, somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, and not just one person, multiple individuals. Long Island, New York is a wealthy neighborhood where educated professionals lead seemingly normal lives. This is also where Gilgo Beach is, a spot named after a skilled fisherman, Gil, who once considered it his secret hunting ground. Contrary to its affluent surroundings, the idyllic place became the center of a disturbing series of events known as the Gilgo Beach murder case. It's a rich community. You've got doctors and cops and very, very wealthy people who live there. No one is ever going to think that that's a bad, dangerous area. This all began when a 911 call came in from a woman named Shannon Gilbert. She was a 23-year-old lady of the night and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She wanted to write. She wanted to be a singer. And recently, she uh, had enrolled in college. The uh, escort service showed her the glamorous side, all the money and all the things that she could get. It was quick, it was fast, it was, you know, a shortcut. On May 1st, 2010, Shannon made a desperate call, claiming that people were trying to kill her. Shannon met her client, Joseph Brewer, at his Oak Beach residence. She was accompanied by her driver and business partner, Michael Pack, who waited for her outside Brewer's house. Moments later, Shannon fled from the man's house in a state of hysteria. Michael and Brewer tried to calm her down, but she was panicking. At this point, she was already talking to the emergency response operator. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. These people are plotting to kill me. Where are you, Shannon? Hello? Hello? Frantically, she ran and banged on the doors of homes in the Oak Beach neighborhood, screaming for help. That was the last time anyone had seen her. At that point, she bolted out and ran down the road that way. He took off after her. That was the last I saw her. We didn't hear another word about it until August. And in August, uh, a plain clothes detective in the Missing Persons Bureau came to my door and he wanted to know what she was wearing, what I remember about her. So I told him everything I knew and I asked him, why did it take four months for you to get around to looking for her? Months later, on December 11th, 2010, the Suffolk County Police K-9 unit made a grim discovery while searching for Shannon along Ocean Parkway at Gilgo Beach. Human skeletal remains were found. This prompted the authorities to notify Shannon's family immediately, as they expected the remains to be hers. However, the police later found that it was not hers. It belonged to another victim, identified as Melissa Barthelemy. Melissa lived in the Bronx on Underhill Avenue. She was a 24-year-old aspiring hairstylist who, like Shannon, worked as a woman of the night. Melissa went missing on July 12, 2009, after meeting a client somewhere in Long Island. She was so feisty and she used to do crazy things even when she was real small. <laughs> she was quite silly. She was very protective of me, so anything I did, she's like, no, you can't go there. No, you're not leaving by yourself. She's just all of a sudden, no, oh, I'm gonna move to New York. And I'm like, don't leave me here. <laughs> Shortly after Melissa's disappearance, her sister Amanda, who was nine years younger, experienced a haunting series of phone calls from a man using the victim's cell phone. The caller tormented Amanda, claiming he had murdered her sister chillingly describing how he would soon watch her body rot. He was just very calm. He was in control. There was nothing I could do about it. Amanda said that he sounded like he was white and he sounded like he was middle-aged. She would ask him a question, he would answer back. It's all about power, about control. This fits in with the serial killer mentality. Three days after Melissa's body was discovered, the police conducted a thorough search of the area. 
What they found were three more sets of skeletal remains, all within about 500 feet of each other. These bodies were all female, but none of them belonged to Shannon. One of the identified victims was Megan Waterman, a 22-year-old mother who also worked as a lady of the night. You could meet Megan the first time you'd fall right in love with her. She didn't take crap from nobody. She was in and out of jail on little petty things. She drank. And I think she got that one from me. But when she had her daughter, she had actually started straightening her life out. Megan, who resided in Scarborough, Maine, traveled to New York for work. Her last known sighting was on June 6, 2010, leaving a hotel in Long Island to meet with a client. When me and my mom got that phone call that Megan was missing, I knew that if they found her, it wasn't going to be a happy outcome. Mother's instinct. The other body was identified as Maureen Brainerd Barnes, a 25-year-old single mother of two from Norwich, Connecticut. Struggling with financial pressure after an eviction notice, Maureen turned to working as an escort. On July 9, 2007, she was last seen in her room at the Super 8 Hotel in Midtown Manhattan, where she had arranged to meet a client through Craigslist. The last of the body was that of Amber Costello, a 27-year-old resident of North Babylon. Grappling with substance dependency, Amber worked as an escort to support her habit. Living with her friend, David Schaller, Amber's last known encounter was on September 2, 2010, when she left to meet a client. This was the same client who threatened her earlier that day, according to David. He told the investigators that he came home that day to find Amber hiding in the bathroom while the client was enraged. Posing as her boyfriend, David confronted the man, who claimed to be a friend, and left. So this is a guy you might have seen. Yeah, this is somebody that I've seen. I might be the, one of the only people who knows who he is. Despite the unsettling encounter, Amber chose to meet the same client later that day, after having been offered six times her usual hourly rate for services. Someone calls me and they were like, have you heard from Amber? And I said, no, why? They're like, because four bodies have been found on Gilgo Beach and they believe you know, the girls worked on Craigslist. Right then, I knew that one of those girls were gonna be my sister. The bodies of the four victims were found concealed in the undergrowth on the south shore of the island. Eerily, they lay just three miles away from the gated community of Oak Beach. These women were all in their 20s, petite, got clients through Craigslist, and shared a tragic connection. Their remains were shrouded in burlap sacks, and each one a victim of strangulation. These four women became known as the Gilgo Beach Four. It just didn't happen to the girls. I mean, it destroyed all of our families. I don't think it's a coincidence that four bodies ended up uh, in this area. We're looking at that, that we could have a serial killer. This led District Attorney Thomas Spada to the conclusion that a serial killer was at large. The shared method, the choice of victims, and the manner in which they were left concealed pointed to a sinister pattern. As the police pressed on with their search for Shannon along Ocean Parkway at Gilgo Beach and Oak Beach, the unsettling discoveries didn't cease. Six more sets of remains were uncovered, yet the method of disposal differed from that of the Gilgo Beach Four. Police are blocking off Ocean Parkway for yet another day to find new leads in the Shannon Gilbert case. This has become a very, very large quantity. Among the remains, police stumbled upon a skull, forearm, and hands that belonged to Jessica Taylor. Jessica, who was also a woman of the night, had suffered a fate that spanned over the years, with her torso having been found in Manorville back in 2003. Another set of remains comprising a skull, hands, and a foot were identified as belonging to Valerie Mack. Valerie was last seen in the spring or summer of 2000 in the vicinity of Port Republic, New Jersey. Her last known address was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, she also worked as an escort. Adding to the macabre discoveries was the body of an unidentified female toddler referred to as Baby Doe. Wrapped in a blanket, her body revealed no apparent signs of trauma. The next body found belonged to an unidentified Asian male dressed in women's clothing. 
Further west, near Tobe Beach, the police found a female skull that was later identified as belonging to Karen Vergata, an escort whose legs had been found on Fire Island back in 1996. The last set of remains were in a plastic bag near Jones Beach State Park. Within this bag lay upper and lower extremities, later identified as belonging to the unidentified female torso found in a bin in Lakeview, New York. Dubbed Peaches due to a distinctive tattoo, the DNA testing conducted later revealed that Peaches was the mother of Baby Doe, the victim found just the week prior. The identification of these remains spanned years, but it was made possible by advanced forensic DNA technology that hadn't existed during the initial incidents. Through this, they could reveal the identities of once nameless victims one by one. Suffolk County District Attorney Thomas Spada asserted that there was no conclusive evidence linking all these remains to the work of a single killer. I've seen a lot of violence, murders, uh, you name it. But this was the largest case that I've ever handled. Despite its status as one of the most high-profile cases of recent decades, progress in the investigation was notably lacking for years. One of the reasons was the negligence and disturbing allegations of corruption within Suffolk County's law enforcement system. The very institution tasked with ensuring justice found itself under scrutiny. For instance, it was revealed that the former New York police chief, James Burke, who had been in charge of the Gilgo Beach murder case, was involved in covering up his own crimes rather than focusing on solving the case. Burke's actions contributed to the stagnation of the investigation, preventing positive progress for years. It wasn't until February 2022 that the Gilgo Beach murder case saw substantial progress. Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison took action by forming a multi-agency task force dedicated to investigating the killings. This collaborative effort involved homicide detectives, the FBI, the Suffolk District Attorney's Office, and the Suffolk Sheriff's Office. Nearly 13 years after the discovery of the first victim, and just six weeks into the task force's creation, a breakthrough emerged. A suspect was found in connection with the Gilgo Beach murders. The task force wasted no time delving into the case files, reading tips and reports in search of crucial clues. Among these files, they stumbled upon a report from David, Amber's friend and roommate. In this report, David described the client who threatened Amber in their home while she hid in the bathroom. The ominous figure was described as ogre-like, a white male in his mid-forties with a large build, standing between six foot four inches and six foot six inches in height. The suspect had dark, bushy hair and sported big oval-style 1970s eyeglasses. He drove a first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche, which was notably parked in the driveway. It turned out that this individual had texted Amber through a burner phone after his interaction with David. Phone records were traced to Massapequa Park, just a couple of minutes from where the message was sent. The investigation also revealed that the other three victims, Maureen, Melissa, and Megan, had all been contacted through burner phones. These calls were traced back to cell towers in Midtown Manhattan, and Massapequa Park. Looking into the communication patterns, authorities found that the calls were made from busy spots in New York City, like Madison Square Garden and Times Square. These locations weren't just connected to the suspect's communication with the victims. They also overlapped with the places where tormenting calls to Amanda, Melissa's younger sister, were made. As the task force delved deeper into the Gilgo Beach murder case, their focus narrowed down to identifying the owner of a first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche within the relevant areas during the disappearances. One person stood out, Rex Hireman. Not only did he own the right vehicle, but he also matched the physical description given by David, being six foot four inches and weighing 240 pounds. With that, Rex Hireman, a 59-year-old architectural consultant, became the prime suspect. He lived in Massapequa Park in the same house where he grew up, having bought it from his mother. There, he shared a home with his second wife, Asa Ellerup, along with his daughter and stepson. Situated across the bay from where the women's remains were found, the house stood on the southeastern edge of Nassau County. He was a loner, not many friends. The children were super mean to him, made fun of him and teased him. 
It was rejected by many girls. Herman worked in the architectural firm he founded in 1994, called RH Consultants and Associates. The firm was situated in Midtown Manhattan. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. A little bit of a nerd in a way. He liked to talk about himself, what he knew. I mean, not a narcissist, but a little bit of a, you know, I know everything kind of guy. When they checked Hireman's personal phone records, they found that his phone consistently appeared in the same areas as those burner phones used to contact the victims. Whether it was in Massapequa Park, where he lived, or Midtown Manhattan, where he worked, Hoyerman's phone records placed him close to the key locations linked to the Gilgo Beach murders. In 2022, they uncovered that Hoyerman had two different burner numbers. To further conceal his identity, he maintained three email accounts under fake names, John Springfield, Thomas Hawk, and Hunter1903. These accounts were linked to the burner numbers, forming a complex web of deceit. Hoyerman used these burner phones to send selfies for hiring ladies. He even had a Tinder account connected to a phone number associated with one of the burner phones. One of the burner email accounts linked to Hoyerman was discovered to be engaged in thousands of inappropriate and unimaginable internet searches. Investigators also found that he wasn't just the subject of their scrutiny. He was watching them, too. While they were busy building a case against him, he was conducting searches on the task force in the Gilgo Beach Four. This included seeking out pictures of the victims and their relatives, trying to locate them. Moreover, it was noted that during the summer vacations, Hireman's wife, Asa, would often take her children out of town or even out of the country. Interestingly, it was precisely during these times that the four women went missing, aligning with the period the police believed the Gilgo Four were murdered. In addition to this circumstantial evidence, there were physical clues pointing to Hireman. His co-worker recalled observing him constantly on the move, running to and from job sites and eating fast food on the way. Once Hoyerman's name surfaced in the investigation, the authorities wasted no time putting him under surveillance. For months, his every move was meticulously monitored as they sought to gather evidence and understand the extent of his involvement in the Gilgo Beach murders. In a seemingly mundane act that would prove pivotal, Hoyerman once discarded a pizza box in a street-side trash can. Little did he know that this act would become a crucial piece of evidence in the investigation. The authorities seized the pizza box and uncovered leftover crusts, providing them with the means to match Hoyerman's DNA with the strands of hair found on the bodies of the victims. The DNA analysis revealed that the male hair found on Megan's body matched Hoyerman's DNA profile. Armed with this compelling evidence, the authorities determined that the time was ripe for Hoyerman's arrest. On July 13, 2023, as Hoyerman clocked out of work, Officers moved in and arrested him just around the corner from his office. We never thought he would be that kind of person. It's shocking. He just looks like a cold monster. And in, in his eyes, I mean, you can just see that it's like a sociopath. He's huge. Yeah. These, none of these girls stood a chance. Detectives then carried out search warrants at Hireman's home and Manhattan Architecture Office, which lasted 12 days. This search uncovered nearly 300 firearms in his basement, with a large portion of them lacking proper registration. Co-workers disclosed that Hoyerman had a keen interest in firearms and was particularly enthusiastic about hunting. Burlap was often used for hunting, so his co-worker was appalled upon knowing that the victims were covered in burlap sacks when they were discovered. The burlap really got to me. Amid the search, authorities also recovered the first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche on Hoyerman's property in South Carolina. While one co-worker initially didn't see Hoyerman as a threat, there was a moment when he left her unnerved. Where are you going? He said, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be in the middle of the ocean. You're not gonna find me in the middle of the ocean. He said, oh, yes I can. During her trip, she then discovered what Hoyerman meant. There was a white envelope under my door. It was a note from him. The note said, I told you I could find you anywhere. The revelation of Hoyerman's alleged double life left everyone in disbelief, especially those close to him. Even his wife, Asa, filed for divorce just days after his arrest. Their home became a chaotic scene, with investigators and media swarming in the aftermath of his arrest. 
Asa and her children struggled to come to terms with the accusations against the head of their family. The arrest disrupted their lives, casting them into an overwhelming and intrusive spotlight. Their life going forward is always going to be the wife or the children of suspected serial killer. That's what it's going to be from now on. She had no idea how this was going on. Beyond the public scrutiny, they found themselves in a financial crisis. Asa, who was already battling an illness, desperately needed funds for her treatment, especially with the imminent loss of health insurance since Heuermann was the sole provider. Her daughter, who worked in her father's company, and her son were now unemployed, leaving them without any other source of income. Asa grappled with the responsibility of supporting them while attempting to rebuild their lives. Despite the severe damage to their house in Massapequa Park during the police search, they continued to reside there. Asa would like me to express her thanks for the support she's received. Um, she's going through a very difficult time. Meanwhile, female hair strands found on Amber and Megan's bodies were confirmed to belong to Asa. Despite this, Asa wasn't considered a suspect since she was out of town or out of the country when the incidents occurred, absolving her from involvement in the crimes. Instead, authorities believe that her hair strands were simply picked up at home by Heuermann and transferred to the victim's bodies. As of this writing, Rex Heuermann faces a litany of charges, including three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of second-degree murder related to the deaths of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. He's also the prime suspect in the death of the fourth victim, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, who was found tied with a belt engraved with the letters WH. This led the authorities to believe that the letters could be the initials of Heuermann's kin. Thus, prosecutors believe that her death might also be added to his charges. Heuermann's lawyer entered a plea of not guilty on his behalf in state court for the murders of Melissa, Megan, and Amber. However, Judge Richard Ambrose acknowledged the alleged extreme depravity of the crimes and denied bail for the accused. While confined within Suffolk County Jail, Heuermann continued to deny his involvement with the murders. While the investigation connected Heuermann to the Gilgo Beach Four, no evidence linked him to the other six bodies discovered. Authorities remained open to the possibility that another serial killer might be responsible for those cases. On December 13, 2011, after a year and a half of searching and a year after the Gilgo Beach Four were discovered, Shannon's body was found in an Oak Beach marsh, not far from where she was last seen. The police deemed her death unrelated to the Gilgo Beach murders and declared it as an accident. Investigators believed she accidentally drowned in the thick marsh as she was influenced by substances that night and in a state of hysteria. However, an inconclusive autopsy result on May 1st, 2012, raised doubts, with her family disputing the notion of her death being accidental. Although it's believed that Shannon wasn't directly linked to the Gilgo Beach murders, her disappearance played a crucial role in uncovering the bodies and ultimately led to the arrest of Rex Heuermann. If my sister, you know, didn't make that 911 call, I don't think that these other women have been recovered either. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.